In 1948, when Israel was created, many Palestinian villages in what became Israel were demolished and destroyed. What you see where these villages were is the prickly pear, the olive tree, because those two are very resilient and they've managed to survive any attempt to change the landscape. With the prickly pear specifically, in the past, historically, it would be used a bit as a hedge between neighbors' lands. This is Franco-Palestinian chef Fadi Katan, a proponent for Palestinian cuisine, and today I'm chatting with him about the culinary wonders of the humble cactus. I'm based in Palestine, the heart of the old city of Bethlehem. So imagine you're evolving in this space that's had history for so long. And that's where cactus is one of the elements of our seasons. You know, part of... Introduced to the Middle East from Mexico, the cactus was brought over by European traders who carried the plant around to prevent scurvy. It was then transplanted all around the Mediterranean, and is now a staple plant adored all over the world for its culinary finesse. The variety of cactus Fadi is talking about is prickly pear. Prickly pear appears in summer because that's when the fruit has matured. It it actually needs quite a bit of heat. So we're talking about mid-summer. So there's already been, you know, a nice good month and a half a very hot weather around and you see the fruit going from its green envelope into this very yellow color and maturing and then turning soft. A season that lasts more or less a month. I'm Clarissa Way, and you're listening to Climate Cuisine, a podcast that explores how sustainable ingredients are grown and prepared in similar climate zones around the world. Now, in the hands of different cultures, one ingredient can take on so many wondrous forms. And as the world faces dramatic upward shifts in our base temperature, climate-centric discussions on crops will become increasingly important to the resiliency of our food systems. This episode is all about cactus, how it's used, how it can be used, and how many people believe it's a crop of the future. Now, growing up in Southern California, cacti, specifically prickly pears, were just a part of the scenic backdrop for me. An afterthought, a pretty spiky thing on the arid dry hills of Los Angeles. I'd see it while hiking, but never paid too much attention to it. But for the Hispanic American community around me, it has always been a staple. The large green pads, known as nopales, can be roasted and grilled, served in a salad or a stew. And the vibrant pink fruit, known as tuna, can be blended in a lush and refreshing beverage. It's an ideal ingredient for a changing climate because of its sheer hardiness. Cactus is not only drought resistant, but it has an incredible storage capacity for water. Some varieties can actually absorb as much as 200 gallons of water during a rainstorm. But for Chef Fadi Katan, it's more than just an ingredient. It's a symbol of defiance. People tell me food is politics in Palestine specifically, and I disagree. I think food is politics everywhere. And access to food and and dealing with waste is political wherever you are. But here particularly, because that cactus, prickly pear, is a very, very resilient plant. It's very symbolic at many levels. It's symbolic in terms of its relation with the land. We are in a land that is very often dry, and the high water content of that prickly pear cactus, it allows it to survive without water input for most of the summer. And therefore, that's why you find it in the different landscapes of Palestine. So from the wetter, mountainous Mediterranean area to the limit of the Palestinian desert and and wilderness. And cactus doesn't just appear in the desert or mountains. Here in Taiwan in the subtropics, we have a cactus named dragon fruit, which is the most cultivated cactus in the world. It grows via aerial roots, and because it is a cactus, it doesn't need that much water. The species has an incredible range, from sand dunes to tropical islands. 
I mean, he's really his claim. It is a bit their symbol. And uh, I think it's very funny that the Israelis call themselves Sabra. The choice of using an Arab fruit and an Arab word makes me smile with this whole thing about, oh, but we're tough on the outside and we're soft on the inside. For Palestinians, we've been cultivating and using cactus since forever. And that celebration of the rhythm of the season, for me, just makes any modern attempt at reclaiming it as theirs futile because you're a country that was created in 1948. How come you claim plants that have been there for a couple of hundred years at least or at least have regenerated into newer plants. But then there's another thing, which for me is quite important. I don't believe in farming prickly pear. While prickly pear orchards are now a mainstay throughout the Mediterranean, Fadi thinks it's actually best left as a wild plant. I really think it's a plant that has its beauty in its growing wild and it's being foraged. I think it has a lot of people that survive on being foragers of prickly pear. And that's where you see the difference. In On the Palestinian side, we don't really farm prickly pear, but people forage it or some people have it in their lands and pick it. While on the Israeli side, they're absolutely trying to have these massive prickly pear farms using water in the desert, which doesn't really exist. I feel the trees like the prickly pear tell us humans Leave me alone for the rest of the year. I'm offering you my bounty during that season. But for the rest of the year, please don't prune me. Don't feed me water. Like, just let me be. And I think that's the beauty of foraged fruits and and vegetables is we depend on their rhythm rather than they depend on our rhythm. Yeah, and I think by having this mentality, you learn so much about the land that you are on and where you are in the world. I think a lot of chefs forget that without the farmers, the butchers, the foragers, the growers, we wouldn't exist. I think that relation is very important because, you know, I can do any tantrum I want in December, I won't get a prickly pear. So how does he use cactus in his cooking? There's two things I mainly do with them. One is a salad. The amount of flesh you have in them is is quite limited. The season where the prickly pears are up in summer, we have also figs, radish, and purslane, which is a watercress. So I do a salad with these four elements. And then what I use to give it a bit of saltiness is I use a dried yogurt called La Benjamid, which comes from the Bedouin tradition. And it's a yogurt that is dried with salt and usually rehydrated to make a sauce out of it. What I do is I use it as is and I do shavings of it on top of that salad. So you get this combination of the different landscapes of Palestine because it's quite a small country but with very varied landscapes and the yogurt, the dried yogurt comes from the Bedouin community so that's a community that's coming from the Palestinian desert and the figs come from the mountainous Mediterranean landscape and then the prickly pear I actually call it a taste of Palestinian summer because I really think that's what it englobes the other thing I do with with the prickly pear is I juice it with its grains and flesh into a pulp and then I cook that until I extract from it a very dense I would call it syrup, but I I don't add sugar to it. It it is just a fruit syrup. And then I use that to flavor things, mainly seafood, because I, I think it has that very interesting taste of being very subtle. It is a very subtle taste. It's an interesting fruit because when you look at it, it does look quite imposing. It has these thorns on the outside, then it's color of like very vivid yellow orange. But actually the taste is extremely subtle. So you mentioned the thorns. I think that's a question a lot of listeners will have. What's the best way to get rid of the thorns? I personally just do the put it over the fire method. The easiest way to do it is you get a gardening glove and you just hold the fruit with the thorns in the gloved hand. And with a very sharp knife, you cut the head off. 
and then you slit across vertically and the skin just goes out with the thorns and everything. In a restaurant setting, I don't usually do it with a gardening glove. We just do it on a working table. You lay down the fruit, cut off the head and the bottom and then you slit it and it peels fantastically if it's mature correctly. Now, if the fruit is too young, the skin doesn't come out. And if it's too mature, it just becomes a mushy mess. At my grandmother's house, where this lady forager from a village next to Bethlehem would usually come with her first pick of prickly pears, and she would sit on the stairs at the entrance of my grandmother's home with my grandmother, and then they would peel the fruit, because you know, the, the fruit has all these thorns on it. I think my grandmother never really peeled them because she was terrorized with the thorns, and then have them into a, a nice container that would go into the fridge. And the, the fruit is actually very nice when it's refrigerated. But that for me is like the essence of that memory of, it's called sabr in Arabic. And sabr very nicely also means in Arabic patience. And I don't know if it's linked, but I personally link it in my imagination of a kid to the time it took that lady to peel each one of these fruits because they're quite tricky. While it takes a lot of effort to process the cacti and get rid of the thorns and cook it, the potential of the plant is immense. And it's not just prickly pear that can be eaten. In the desert of Arizona, there's a cactus known as the barrel cactus, which looks a lot like a pineapple. There should be a number of different species. And then when they go to fruit to make their seeds and reproduce, they make what looks like a little miniature pineapple on the top. I'm Alan Burgo. I'm a chef from Minnesota. Now I live in Wisconsin. I have a three-part book series. The first one is out, it's called Flora. It came out this year. It's all about plants, wild plants, herbs. Wild food is kind of my game and what I study the most and what people will know me for. So everywhere I go, I'm always looking for new things to harvest. And when I go to the desert, to Arizona, to see my grandparents in the winter, my dad and I go hiking and I'm always looking for new edibles. And barrel cactus buds have been one of my favorite ones that I've found down there so far. They're bright yellow, at least the ones that I pick. They're very sour, they're slightly mucilaginous and there's a lot of different things that you can do with them. I'm always inspired by indigenous uses of plants. So I met with Felicia Ruiz, who is in Arizona as well. And I've been corresponding with her over the past few years. And she introduced me to like saguaro seeds, but I knew that I could probably use the fruit of the barrel cactus similarly. So what you have is like two different ingredients inside the same thing. So the flesh of the little pineapple, so to speak, is kind of sour and tart. And traditionally what's done is it's dehydrated. So you dehydrate it and then you can rehydrate it and it'll get tender and soft after you simmer it for a little bit. Typically it's gonna be in soup or a jam or a preserve or something like that. And it keeps some of that tart flavor. Then the seeds are almost like grain or something. I toast them and then I grind them up and I make a flatbread. They have sort of an aroma like mild roasted coffee and you can grind them into a meal or a flour and cook with them. Or you can just sprinkle them into something like Felicia makes a, a sweet jam out of the cactus, which is great. And then she just sprinkles the seeds in for a little bit of texture. They're really just a versatile, super interesting plant. It's all over. I pick them out of people's yards. I pick them in the wild. They're all over the place there and something that a lot of people wouldn't think of. Now, different varieties of cacti have different flavors, of course. You know, if you've ever tasted a cactus fruit, you would be amazed at how delicious they are. The way I would describe it is the fruit is a cross between a watermelon and a mango. Very refreshing, just delicious. This is John Cushman, a biochemistry professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. He wrote a study that shows how the prickly pear can be used for sustainable fuel and food. The consumer acceptance for that kind of fruit with a unique flavor profile is going to be very easy. Cactus is also used for many other purposes, so it's fed to livestock as either a forage or it can be harvested and diced 
and fed as fodder. And also it's used as a biofuel feedstock for the production of biogas and bioethanol. Some of the key findings. Some varieties of cacti use 80% less water than traditional crops, and it can be used as a biofuel, which means it can be an alternative to water-heavy crops like soybeans and corn in the near future. According to John, 42% of land area around the world is already classified as semi-arid or arid. This figure will only increase with climate change, and the good news is that these are the conditions that cacti actually thrive in. And what was surprising about the study? It was conducted over a period of five years, correct? Was there something that you guys found that people didn't really necessarily know before? Well, there were a couple of things. One is just the amazing productivity of cactus. We estimated that the cactus field produced an average of 11.6 megatons per hectare per year, and that's over a five-year period. But once the cactus got going in the last year, it produced 68 megagrams per hectare per year. And that's an amazingly productive plant. The other thing that amazed us is that it's very water use efficient. The optimal productivity was obtained with just 416 millimeters of precipitation a year. And that is because cactus is a crassulacean acid metabolism or CAM plant, that is about fivefold less water than you would use for other kinds of crops. So the water use efficiency, the low water input, and yet having a very high productivity of biomass on an annualized basis was what really amazed us. Does it have the potential to become a staple food source, like soybeans and corn? Can it even reach that level? Well, certainly the productivity, as our study showed, is comparable to those other feedstocks for biofuels. So soybean is used for biodiesel and corn or maize is used for bioethanol right now. And our study showed that our cactus crops provided comparable productivity, but with much less water input. In terms of biofuel, the cactus shows a great deal of promise. And in terms of forage and fodder, a lot of studies have been done looking at animal feeding, and you can replace up to 40% of a cow's diet with a cactus and up to 100% of a goat's diet with cactus. And in arid lands throughout the world, because the cactus pads themselves are 90% water, those can also provide a water source in areas where water is very limiting. And in terms of a human food, cactus is primarily pectin. We eat a lot of pectin in our diets as human beings. So most fruits and vegetables have a lot of pectin in it. And the majority of our pectin right now that goes into things like jams and jellies as a thickening agent, that primarily comes from citrus. And so one of the things that we're looking at is could we use cactus as a replacement for citrus pectin? But what about the systems in which these cacti are grown? We just did an episode on cassava, and it's a really sustainable tuber, but it's grown in these large monoculture systems, and now there's the cassava virus and it's posing a problem. Does cactus have that issue? One of the goals of our project is to look at some of the production barriers associated with cactus pear. And one of the big issues is a disease. We think it's caused by a virus, although we're not sure. And our research program is trying to address what this causative agent is. And the disease is called a Puntia stunting disease, or in Spanish, it's called macho. And it causes the pads to become very stunted or very small, and it also causes the fruit to become very small. And so it's a major production barrier. And so what we'd like to do is sort out what is causing this disease and figure out how we can treat the cactus to overcome this disease. So just like any crop, it's going to have its own set of challenges and and diseases. But in drier areas, we saw very few diseases in our cactus trial. 
And that's because it's grown under very dry and hot cultures. And so we had a minimal effects of diseases. The potential extends to beyond just food. Turns out the cactus can be made into vegan leather. And Deserto, a Mexican biomaterial company, is behind this new fashion trend. Well, my name is Adrian Lopez Velarde. I am the co-founder of Deserto, which is a biomaterial based of cactus as an alternative to leather and synthetic materials. Our launch was on October 2019 in Milan, Italy. And since then, we have been working with several brands around the globe. Some of the most iconic collaborations involve names like Fossil, Adidas, Karl Lagerfeld, H&M. Before Europe, Spain discovered Mexico, this was already a traditional dish for the Aboriginal cultures like the Aztecs. The plant has been very important for symbolic meanings, not only in cuisine, but also in, in art. You can see that cactus was really the center of the culture of these tribes. Of course, it made an important part of their diet. When Spain came to Mexico, they found that these plants give fruit. So then they brought it to Europe, and then from Europe, they started to cultivate in the castles of the kings and noble people. It spread through the Mediterranean because that's where the environment allowed the reproduction of the plant and the growth a better way than in northern part of Europe because it's too cold. So in the Mediterranean, the birds eat the fruit and then they drop the seeds around the whole Mediterranean and the plant really reproduces very well. And then when the Northern Africa people traveled to Spain and Europe, they saw that this was a very amazing plant that could give them fruit and could give them a lot of fiber. Also, it is a very resilient species which doesn't need any irrigation, no herbicides, no pesticides, no fertilizers. That on itself is a sustainable advantage because we don't have to attack the environment by relying on this crop. We are rather contributing to nature instead of working against it. So it was a very interesting alternative, a very interesting crop, abundant, native of Mexico. So that's why we decided to do all the R&D around this plant. We thought, well, if the cactus is so efficient and so resilient and, and can endure such harsh conditions, what if we take all these skills of the plant and evolve them into a biomaterial? So I was reading your website about how you guys have an organic cactus farm. I think when people think farms, they think giant farms and they don't necessarily equate that with sustainability. But what about this plant makes it so special? That's a very important point. Well, nowadays, climate change is one of the biggest challenges that humanity has to face. And in the future, prolonged droughts and their certification are the subjects. This will be addressed by several countries, especially Asia and Africa, where farmers and small producers of low income will be seriously affected. And if people want to survive on these harsh conditions, their crops must need to tolerate drought, high temperatures and poor soils. Cactus is a very interesting plant because it gives the opportunity to not only provide jobs in these harsh conditions, but also it is a very interesting plant that can restore soil properties and that can serve as water reserves because of the amount of water that they can absorb from the humidity present in the environment. So what we do is that we keep it as natural as possible in ways that you don't apply irrigation, as I mentioned before, no herbicides, no pesticides, no fertilizers. It's 100% organic. And beyond that, 
you have the plant restoring the microflora and the microfauna of soil, enriching biodiversity in the region while absorbing carbon dioxide. And when we harvest the cactus paths, we are not hurting the plant. We are not damaging it. So the roots stay there, the plants stay there. And every six months, we are able to do a harvest. And this is given also the strength of the plant and the ability of growing biomass faster than many other crops. Cactus has this amazing capability of growing biomass with the least input of resources like water, for instance. I mean, it gives you two harvests a year. It's amazing. So from food to biofuel to fashion, the cactus is one of the most versatile plants I've ever come across. And it's clear that it's a plant that will become increasingly important to our society as temperatures rise and water becomes more scarce. A thank you to the Climate Cuisine team, co-producer and audio editor Kat Hong, researcher Olivia Maeda, production assistant Xin Yun, and intern Indio Clarkson. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glazier, sound engineer Max Katolchak, associate producer Quentin LeBeau, and sound intern Simon Lavender. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, on Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel Whetstone Radio Collective for more podcast video content. And you can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemedia.com.